Well, good morning, everyone. This morning, we will be back in Numbers, a Numbers chapter 12, although we're going to start back in 10 uh, briefly. And last time, uh, we were looking at how they were setting out uh, from their year at Sinai after being constituted God's, uh, well, they're supposed to be God's holy uh, and righteous people uh, to proclaim his word, uh, to be a holy people that he's going to bring to the land uh, that he has prepared for them uh, to plant them, uh, to uh, make them fruitful and multiply in the land, uh, to be a blessing uh, to all the earth and to all nations. And so they're setting out from Sinai uh, to the wilderness of Paran, and that's where in Numbers 13, uh, you'll encounter the spies going out uh, to uh, track through the land and see, is it a good land that God is, is giving them? And indeed it is. But I wanted to show you something that we didn't cover last time, and we'll have to uh, pace ourselves. We have a fellowship meal, so we'll see how far we get this week, uh, and then uh, maybe, Lord willing, uh, we'll uh, finish next week. But in these chapters, as they set out, it's actually constructed and framed around the days of creation. Uh, and so first, there are seven days along the way. Uh, they set out for three days, uh, and then they make their stop in uh, Hazerot. Uh, and usually when they camp, you have one day, and we'll see some indications of this. And then... Uh, uh, or it was at Tabera uh, where they were burned. And so fourth, it's the fourth day, uh, one day there. Uh, and then they moved to Kivrot Hatava, where another three days pass uh, along, along the way. And so they set out on the 20th, uh, three days uh, journey into the wilderness. So uh, 20th through 23rd. And then one day at Tabera, 24th, and then three more days uh, spent at Kivrot Hatava. And we'll see all this creation imagery that floods through. We'll just read the text and I'll, I'll make a few comments along the way. And then as we go to Miriam and Aaron's rebellion, where we see this complaining, uh, this grumbling, uh, these sinful cravings spreading throughout the camp from the outskirts uh, to the tribes uh, around, around the Levites, then to the Levites around the tabernacle with uh, Miriam and Aaron uh, in there, uh, their, uh, their entrance into the wilderness of Paran will be delayed because of Miriam's sin. Uh, and we're going to see a lot of imagery and ideas and echoes back to uh, the uh, creation of the man and the woman and the temptation uh, by the, the serpent uh, with uh, Miriam and, and Aaron. Uh, and so... Uh, Moses is drawing all of these connections uh, to make us think back uh, to the garden, to these things, as God brings his people uh, through, uh, through the wilderness. Which also shows the connection between the, the garden and the wilderness uh, it wasn't something new. It wasn't just in the New Testament, but it's drawing on all of these things uh, in, the, in the old. Uh, and also I'll mention that at the beginning of chapter 10, uh, they make trumpets to, to go out on their, their way. They make two trumpets. Uh, and this likely echoes back to the trumpets at Sinai uh, as they came to the mountain uh, and they, they heard the, the trumpets and saw the smoke and a flame of fire and uh, lightning uh, as God manifested uh, his presence in a theophany uh, at Mount Sinai. And really, it seems like there's almost sort of a, a grand chiasm uh, as you come through Leviticus with the Day of Atonement at the center, uh, and then you start working back. You have the trumpets setting out three days, 
it was three days at, at Sinai and when they first went to the wilderness, and then through the, through the wilderness now to the promised land. So first they came out on the exodus uh, across the sea through the wilderness to Sinai, uh, now coming, coming out uh, to go to the, the promised land after being constituted a people. So let's look at first uh, verse 11, chapter 10. In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, uh, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. And then it spe speaks about all of their uh, setting out, settings out uh, along the, the way of all the, the tribes uh, to the east, south, west, and north of the camp, uh, Judah as, as the head at, at the, the east, uh, and also the, the Levites as well around the, the tabernacle. So you have these three layers, remember, tabernacle, Levites, uh, east, south, west, north, and then the tribes, east, uh, south, west, north, uh, along the way, and they'd set out from the east uh, and all around to the, to the north. And verse 29. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite. So again, another echo back to Jethro in Exodus 18 uh, as they arrived at Sinai. And so that's part of this sort of, let me say there, there's almost sort of a chiasm as you work through these temptations in the wilderness, uh, making these connections uh, to remember God's testing, God's promises, uh, the good that he spoke to uh, to Jethro that God had done for him. Uh, Moses speaking with uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, uh, the father of uh, Zipporah, his wife, uh, and now with his uh, his brother-in-law, Hobab, speaking of what good God will do to them. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place in or we are setting out for the place of which Yahweh said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. For Yahweh has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I will depart to my own land and to my own kindred. And he said, please do not leave us. For you know where we should camp in the wilderness. And you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good Yahweh will do to us, the same we will do to you. And now the setting out. So first, first three days that, that will connect with creation and we'll see this more and more as we work through. Uh, and we'll just read through and then we'll get to Miriam and Aaron and begin uh, to see the, the next seven days that, uh, that follow uh, with uh, Miriam and Aaron now rebelling against uh, God's servant Moses and against God himself. Uh, very, very much like the serpent, the man and the woman uh, in the garden. So verse 33, so they set out from the Mount of Yahweh three days journey and the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh went before them three days journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of Yahweh was over them by day uh, whenever they set out from the camp. Uh, and th th we'll see more Im stronger imagery as we go, uh, but we, we start seeing uh, cloud, day, uh, heavens, uh, and it'll just build as we go through, uh, as in creation. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Yahweh, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. So first three days into the wilderness, uh, now they're at Taberah. Uh, and the same sort of thing happens when they come out of the Exodus. Uh, they have about four stops along the way uh, in crossing the sea as the, the, the days pass and then three days into the wilderness. And so as they went into the wilderness, uh, it probably ended with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, coming out on the Passover the 14th and the 21st, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread came to uh, a conclusion. I've done quite a bit of work with the uh, chronology of, 
uh, of Exodus, and we'll look more at that, Lord willing, in the future. And so, three days, now, uh, now they're at Tabera. And that's when God created the, uh, all of the luminaries, uh, the sun, or the greater light, the lesser light, uh, and the, the stars. And he avoids the, the term sun and moon, uh, maybe because of uh, uh, sort of pagan connections that people might make with them. So, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And the people complained uh, in the hearing of Yahweh about their misfortunes, and when Yahweh heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of Yahweh burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to Yahweh, and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Taberah, because the fire of the Yahweh burned among them. So on the outskirts, and pil a pillar of uh, cloud by day and fire by night to give them light and warmth, but now the fire of Yahweh consumes them like Nadab and Abihu. And now uh, we turn to the, the rabble at Kivra Hatava, and we'll see a de again uh, a day change because he's going to say the manna came down uh, in, the, uh, in, in the evening with the dew, so in the morning. They receive it in the morning with the darkness, the dew, and then they collect it in the, in the morning. And we'll even see terms, like with the fifth day and such, we're going to see some of these uh, animals like uh, fish, uh, for, for instance. Uh, he's going to draw in, uh, creation animals as he goes through, and even like the quail uh, and such. Uh, as he speaks with Moses. So verse 4, uh, Now the rabble that was among them, so this riffraff, uh, had, a, had a strong craving. And the people of Israel, or sons of Israel, also wept uh, again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. Uh, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. Uh, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at uh, be, before their eyes, ungrateful for God's uh, provision. So they want meat. They want fish uh, instead of this uh, manna that, that God has, uh, has given them. And you have the creation of the fish on the, on the, the fifth day. And so, uh, verse 7 now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance like that of bdellium. Uh, the people went about and gathered it and ground it in hand mills or beat it in mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. Shad HaShaman, the, the best, creamiest part of the oil. When the dew fell upon the camp in the night, uh, the manna fell with it. So, time indicator. They, they received it in in the morning. And so uh, there'd be grumbling and such with the coming of the dew uh, and God's provision of manna for them, uh, which was for the man and the woman uh, and humanity at creation, but now for his people in the wilderness. And so, uh, verse 10, uh, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of Yahweh blazed hotly. And Moses was dis displeased. Moses said to Yahweh, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get me to give to all this people? For they weep before me and say, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. And so Mo Moses' complaint, yeah, about all this people, all this people, all this people. But uh, his he's, uh, complaints really at, at God, uh, first, first and foremost. 
uh, for, for this people uh, that and the commissioning of Moses as his prophet, his judge, his steward uh, to bring the people through the land uh, with, with God's provision, God's presence, God's spirit. Uh, and so he complains. Then verse 16 uh, we see God's uh, gracious provision for Moses again, as we covered, if you missed, uh, the sermons online. And so uh, we just had it a couple weeks ago. And so God's gracious provision for, for Moses of the elders and his retributive penal provision for the people. Uh, yep, they'll, they'll still eat. They won't starve, but uh, it'll be punishment. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is upon you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone." So God's, uh, God's provision in verse 18, and say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. So you'll be the, the sixth day. Right now it's the fifth, fifth day uh, setting out as he's speaking with uh, Moses. Uh, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of Yahweh saying, who will give us meat that we may eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, Yahweh will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out at your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected Yahweh who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? And so he's going to give them the, the provision of uh, the, the quail. And so he's going to give them meat uh, as, as they uh, requested. And now is it, we, we have Moses uh, give his uh, exasperated sort of, how are you going to do this? God, how, how can you feed all these people? And so, Kind of, a, kind of a, a objection, not thinking about God's presence uh, in their midst, but the people. And so verse 21, but Moses said, the people among, well, it, it's really uh, the, the people uh, of, of whom I am in their midst are 600,000 uh, on foot. Uh, and you have said, I will give them meat that they may eat a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them, and it be enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them, uh, and be enough for them? Uh, and so, again, echoing back to the fish, on, on day five, as they're discussing this, uh, and you, you had the other uh, animals and uh, land animals on, on day six that were given, and the provision to, uh, to man. Uh, of the vegetation, provision for his people. And uh, Yahweh's response, verse 23, and Yahweh said to Moses, is Yahweh's hand shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. Uh, God's word uh, comes true uh, and in creation, uh, I believe he speaks uh, specifically uh, with, with content uh, 10 times. You have like the 10 words with the 10 commandments. He speaks and the creation stands fast. Uh, and he brings about uh, into existence uh, all that he intends and purposes. And so Moses just doubted like the, the people. And now uh, we'll be seeing where, I think when you get to the elders, we'll see that with the transition from the dialogue uh, to the narrative, he'll, he'll speak with them but then the, the gathering likely is on a day, day six uh, with the, the provision of the, uh, the quail. And so we had three days into the wilderness. 
Uh, and then we had one day at Tavera, uh, fourth day, and then uh, one day at Kivra Hatava so far, so far uh, and we'll, we'll have another uh, two for, for six and seven. So uh, verse 24, uh, so Moses went out and told the people the words of Yahweh. Uh, they're to be consecrated for, for the next day. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then Yahweh came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. Uh, they were among those registered or written down, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. Uh, and with on the, the sixth day, God creates man uh, in his own image after his likeness. Uh, man is uh, indwelt uh, by the, the spirit of God uh, in, the, in the garden. Uh, the, the man and the woman, God breathes into him the, the breath of life, uh, and they live and dwell uh, in, his, uh, in his presence. Uh, and you really see similar things. You can see similar things with the plagues, but with the contributions for the tabernacle at the end of Exodus and the building of the tabernacle, you'll have sections where Yahweh will instruct uh, to, the, to, to make contributions for all of the, uh, the, the implements, the, the objects that were to fill the, the tabernacle. Uh, and then he'll go on to speak about like the tabernacle itself, the courtyard. And there, there are seven times where it interrupts God's speech to say, and God said. And he'll divide it along creation again. And so when you get to the end of that, you'll have things in these different sections with the contributions, uh, with the uh, building of the tabernacle, the creating of these objects, uh, the uh, anointing of the priests, where uh, the priestly garments uh, will be spoken of uh, sixth, or a holy or Bezalel and Aholiab, the craftsmen, will be appointed sixth. Uh, Aaron and his sons will be appointed sixth, like with the sixth day, the creation of man. Uh, and God purposefully does this uh, to show this new creation imagery, you have all this tabernacle imagery uh, in the garden, but then creation is brought into uh, the tabernacle uh, with, uh, with the lights, with the, the figs, with the, uh, all, all, how they decorated it and everything. And then it will conclude with the Sabbath, instructions on the Sabbath. Uh, and it's there, I think, around going from maybe Exodus 33 into 34, it concludes with instructions on the Sabbath, and then they rebel and build the golden calf. And so you, you have these same sort of things that, that recur to make these connections uh, where uh, the, the author wants us to, uh, to see these things and, and make uh, these, these connections. So uh, you have the, the anointing or the, the spirit comes upon these, these elders uh, and these two who prophesy uh, who are to bear the burden uh, with uh, Moses, God's provision for Moses. And so then uh, verse, 20, verse 26, I will just read right through it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. Uh, they were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all Yahweh's people were prophets, that Yahweh would put his spirit upon them. Uh, and Moses and the elders of Israel returned to uh, the camp. And so now we'll get to the, the penal provision for the, the people of the, the quail.
And so you, you likely had, the, with the instruction of the people, likely the elders were anointed on the sixth day because it immediately follows. They were to consecrate and prepare themselves, the people, uh, to, for the quail, for God's, God's provision to uh, the people. He's going to perform uh, a great miracle uh, in, their, in their midst. Uh, and immediately following the elders, it says, and, and Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. And now we'll, we'll get, we'll get to, the, to the quail. And they'll gather it that day and the next day as well. So likely between the, the dialogue and the instruction and the narrative, uh, we're at the, the sixth day. Then a wind from Yahweh sprang up and it brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side around the camp and about two cubits above the ground. And the people rose all that day and all that night and all the next day. So all that day, all that night. So six, six day and all the next day, seventh day, which might not necessarily be the Sabbath. They do sin in the Sabbath in their first time through the wilderness out of Egypt, but it's the 27th. If you follow maybe sort of a prototypical 30-day calendar, a sort of a lunar 360-day, uh, which often that's, that's how they'd write. It might not be the Sabbath necessarily, but you have these seven days uh, along the way. It's not the, the, tw the, the 28th would be the, uh, the conclusion of the fourth week of the, the month. So, so and the, the people rose, uh, verse 32, and the people rose all that day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against the people, and Yahweh struck down the people with a very great plague, or he, he struck them with a very great blow. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. You have similar language echoing, uh, echoing back. Now he strikes them down with a very great uh, blow. Uh, 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 instead of tov me'od, you know, very good, uh, a very great blow. Uh, and so he struck down the people uh, with a very great blow. Uh, therefore, uh, the name of that place was called Kivra Hatava, Graves of the Craving, uh, because there they buried the people who had the craving. From Kivra Hatava, the people journeyed to ha Hazerot, and they remained at Hazerot. Uh, and so now going through this, you have the three days into the wilderness, one at Tabera, and then three days uh, at Kivro Hatava with God's provision of the quail to his people. And he provided for man all the way back uh, at a creation but then with the seventh day, where the people are to be going to enter into God's rest, where even said God was going ahead in a pillar of cloud and fire to find a resting place for them, where they would have rest on the seventh day. God rested. And so they're looking to enter into God's rest, into his promises, uh, to be planted as his people, to enjoy the fullness of his presence, provision, blessing and rule uh, and to be a blessing to all nations but you get to the end with uh, seven days uh, through through the wilderness heading out to the, the promised land and instead of uh, the people with a very great craving uh, they go down to the pit they go down to their graves uh, their, their sinful passions and desires never cease, they always want more, 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 and eventually lead to their destruction 
and bring them down to the grave, uh, to, their, to their deaths, and God struck them down. Uh, and now we're going to see, so you've had seven days pass, and so now we're likely on the eighth day, or the 28th of the second month. It's the second year, because they spent a year at, at Sinai, uh, after their they were brought out of Egypt and constituted as a, as a people. And so they're supposed to be going into the uh, wilderness of, of Paran to the promised land. But now Miriam and Aaron, uh, who, who dwelt with Moses just to the east of the tabernacle, with, with the Levites, right by God's tabernacle, who were his stewards, his servants, now they are going to rebel uh, against, against God's servant Moses and against God himself. And so we, we just see the, the progression of this sin and rebellion of the people from the outskirts of the camp uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the people all around the camp at, at Kivra Hatava, uh, all of the, the tribes, now to the, to the very, very heart, to even to Miriam and Aaron. Well, Christy, or anyone, how, did anyone notice when exactly we started? I forgot to turn my timer on. Okay. Thank you. And so now with uh, Miriam and Aaron, we're going we're gonna to see uh, throughout this, well, it's going to lead to her judgment for, for seven days. But throughout this section, which is really framed as a, a chiasm, where we'll be seeing uh, the location from which they, they depart to this new location. Uh, then er, uh, Miriam and Aaron will speak a couple times. Uh, then we'll have God hearing and a uh, description of Moses' humility. And then God will summon them. And then he will, uh, he will rebuke them and then depart from them. And so summoning, departing, uh, and then Aaron will end up turning to speak to, uh, to Moses uh, and Moses uh, to God. And there will be echoes all the way through. And at the very heart of this is God's rebuke against Miriam and Aaron. Uh, and, and the very center of that is, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. So that, that's the very heart of this uh, section uh, that we'll be reading through. And so let, let's just uh, read, uh, read through the, the text uh, to get, get an overview. And then we'll, we'll see how far we can get uh, this week. And then, Lord willing, we'll, we'll continue uh, next week. So start with uh, chapter 11, verse 35. From Kivrot Hatava, the people journeyed to Hazerot, and they remained at Hazerot. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And uh, the Lord heard it, or Yahweh heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly uh, Yahweh said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And Yahweh came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. 
if there is a prophet among you of Yahweh, I make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, visibly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of Yahweh. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, do not punish us, because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to Yahweh, Oh God, please heal her. But Yahweh said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazarot and camped in the wilderness of Paran. And that's uh, where the, the spies uh, will come in. Uh, and with the spies, their, their ultimate rebellion, which will lead to 40 years uh, in, the, in the wilderness. And they won't be able to enter the, the land. And so, to begin here, uh, we, we start a change of uh, location. So uh, back in verse 35 of, of the last chapter, uh, from Kivrot Hatava, the people journeyed to Hazerot, and they remained at Hazerot. Now, we don't know the significance of Hazerot yet. However, uh, Tabera wasn't so good. Burn. The fire of Yahweh burned among them. Uh, Kivro Hatava didn't turn out so well uh, either. Uh, graves of the craving. In fact, going back into their entrance into the wilderness out of Egypt uh, before their year at Sinai, heading to Sinai, uh, along the way, uh, they were at Marah, bitter with the bitter waters, and the people, they complained against Yahweh. So there's a sense in which they were bitterly complaining against, against Yahweh at the, the bitter waters that God made sweet. And so part of it speaks of God's provision, but you see the bitterness of the people as they go along. Uh, they also oh, spent some uh, time uh, at... In Rephidim, uh, the place was called uh, Massah and Meribah. Testing and quarreling, where they tested Yahweh and they quarreled uh, against him. Again, complaining over, they have nothing to drink. Did you bring us into the wilderness to die and kill all of our children of thirst? Uh, and so, again and again, uh, all of their itinerary, Sometimes he'll be named, you know, have to do with God's provision. But by and large, it's reminders of their rebellion against God, uh, their ingratitude, their unbelief. And so now you arrive at, we, we just had seven days out, and they end at Tabera burning in Kivra Hatava, graves of the craving, where they buried the people who had the craving, who went down to the pit. Uh, how much better is Hazaro going to be? Uh, not at all. Uh, we'll find out. And so now, a change of, of location, new scene. Uh, now uh, Aaron, or Miriam and Aaron uh, speak up. And so verse 12. Uh, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses uh, because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. 
And so here, Vatedaber Miriam be Aharon de Moshe. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Now, if you think about uh, Miriam and Aaron, Miriam, Aaron, Moses, uh, they're the, the siblings of, of Moses, uh, his sister and uh, brother. And does anyone know of Miriam, Aaron, and Moses? Who's the oldest of the three and who's the, the youngest? Feel free to answer. Moses is the youngest, oldest? Or who's the oldest then? Yeah, yeah. And Aaron, Aaron's in the middle. Uh, because uh, when, well, when they set out uh, and God appoints Moses and Aaron, uh, Moses is 80 and Aaron is 83. And when Aaron dies, he's 123. And when Moses dies, he's 120. And so Aaron's about three years older uh, than, than Moses. Uh, and when Moses was just th three months of age, and his mother put him, put him like an ark or sort of a, a basket. It wasn't three-year-old Aaron who was uh, out at the, uh, uh, watching over the, the ark and, and uh, reasoning uh, quite, quite well with uh, uh, the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, <laughs> you know, she, she was uh, pretty, pretty sharp. And so Miriam is the, the very oldest uh, of, the, of the three, and then Aaron, and then Moses. Moses is the youngest, but Moses was appointed Yahweh's prophet, a Yahweh's spokesman. He even said, you shall be as God, as Elohim, to Aaron, your brother, and he will be your prophet. And so as, you're, as I'm the one true living God, and you're my prophet, Aaron will be your prophet, and what I speak to you, you will speak to him. But Aaron, he's no light, light person of little status uh, in Israel. Uh, he's, he's the prophet of Moses. Uh, he, he's a prophet. He's, he's a spokesman. He even, uh, God even says, I know he can speak well. You know, unlike Moses' uh, critique about himself. And uh, Aaron, Aaron is made the high priest. Now, Moses is the mediator of the covenant, uh, and so he has to set up the tabernacle. He has to perform uh, the purification ritual, rituals and the anointing of Aaron. And so Moses himself is a priest. We're speaking about that in our Wednesday night classes. There's a sense in which Moses is prophet, pre, prophet, priest, judge, and, in a sense, king. Uh, he was a prince among the people in his own, own day. But Aaron was the high priest, and, and he even wore an emblem ac uh, across his forehead, uh, which was a form of a, a crown that said, holy to the Lord. And he represented Yahweh on the Day of Atonement. Uh, and so Aaron was very important, and even Miriam, she was, she was a prophetess. In fact, uh, as they come out of the, the wilderness in Exodus 15, as they come through and they, uh, they sing uh, this new song to, uh, to Yahweh for his great deliverance uh, and crushing uh, Pharaoh's uh, soldiers and chariots under the, the sea, uh, then Miriam led the women uh, in procession and dancing and song, uh, and he calls her a prophetess. Uh, and so... Uh, she was making proclamation. Uh, she was exhorting and edifying uh, in leading the women in song. And so uh, Miriam and Aaron, uh, th they had important roles in, uh, in uh, God's uh, people, uh, in his uh, household uh, that he had established with Israel. But it's very interesting. Vatedaber Miriam the Aharon. Vatedaber. That's feminine, feminine singular, uh, spoke. And so Miriam is leading this. Aaron is going along with her, but Miriam is uh, leading, uh, leading this. Uh, that's why it uses the, the feminine singular 
for Miriam, and we'll see that the, the judgment, the punishment, God will rebuke both of them, but the punishment is going to come upon her. And we see things out of order. Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, well, that's the order of who is leading this thing against Moses. And Miriam, the oldest, followed by Aaron, and then uh, Moses, Moshe. Uh, but that's not the order that God established of authority that he gave to Moses to speak his words. And so it's rebellion against God. It's rebellion against his word. Uh, and like in the garden, uh, we will see uh, where everything's turned out of order. Eve listened to the creature, the serpent. So you, you, you have uh, the, the Satan, the, the adversary who, who comes in the form of a serpent. And she listens to the serpent that they were to be over. God put uh, humanity over the creatures. But she listens to him. Uh, and then the man Yahweh says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you ate from the tree of which I said to you, you shall not eat from it. Now, sometimes it's okay to listen to the voice of your wife uh, in scripture, but not when she's rebelling against God. Uh, same for husbands. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, it can be okay to listen to your husbands, but not if they're going to rebel against God. Uh, God is the ultimate supreme authority. And so you have everything turned upside down. Uh, the, the, the woman listens to the serpent, who they were put over. Uh, the man was created first, but he, he listened to the woman. Uh, and uh, they, they, were, they were equal in, uh, as image bearers of God. But the man had specific responsibility not to rebel against God as his steward that he had appointed in the garden. And so you see everything turned upside down, and then God's judgments set things semi-right, but with, now with conflict uh, in, involved uh, in, in punishment. And so he first judges the serpent, uh, and then the, the woman and the, the man, and there's conflict between them. And so we're going to see that reversal with Miriam, Aaron, and Moses uh, as we read through. And we'll probably just touch on the starting part, and then we can go in more depth uh, next, next week. And so let's start to deal with this issue of this uh, Cushite woman uh, whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. So here's, here's the reason that Miriam and Aaron uh, supposedly are uh, rebelling against, uh, against Moses and speaking against him. He had married a Cushite woman. Now, who is this Cushite woman? Because we know that Moses married uh, Zipporah uh, during his 40-year uh, sojourn uh, between the ages of 40 and 80 uh, in Midian uh, with uh, Jethro. Uh, he married uh, Zipporah. Uh, but she's a, a Midianite. Uh, what's it doing calling her uh, a Cushite? Well, th there are a couple options. Uh, some suggest that, well, maybe Zipporah died and this is a new wife that, that he had taken. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll see that, uh, I think there's better, better explanation for, for a number of reasons. Uh, for, for one, uh, we already saw that framing this, this account, uh, Moses spoke with Hobab, the son of Jethro, uh, as they were setting out, which echoed all the way back to, and so that's the brother of, of Zipporah and the son of Jethro, uh, the, fa the father of Zipporah and Hobab, the brother and sister. And th that connected all the way back to Exodus 18 with their, their arrival at Sinai uh, in uh, Jethro, uh, Moses speaking of all the good he had done with them and bringing Zipporah and uh, her, her sons, uh, Moses' sons, uh, to him. And so the, there was some time between Moses' journey back to Israel 
uh, and his, uh, his failing to circumcise his son that uh, Zipporah uh, and her sons uh, went back to, to Jethro uh, sometime between their going back, between the plagues, uh, between the, the crossing of the wilderness, uh, they met up with, uh, with uh, Jethro, uh, maybe as Moses was uh, leading and had, had a responsibility in confronting uh, Pharaoh uh, over those uh, few, few weeks or so. Uh, but also, uh, some issues of chronology, sometimes uh, things can also be arranged thematically and such. It seems that Jethro probably met up as they were at or near, uh, near Sinai, but it, it links back to that. And so we're supposed to make these connections that framing uh, these seven days as they're setting out, okay, Cushite woman, Hobab, uh, her brother, uh, Jethro, uh, and then go to Genesis chapter 10. So here we have the table of the, the nations uh, where, with the spreading out of the sons of Noah, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, Shem is blessed, uh, but Ham, son Canaan, is, uh, is cursed. Uh, and as you begin to uh, read through this section, uh, verse 6, uh, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, uh, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sabtecha. The sons of Rama, Sh uh, Sheba, and Dedan. And so descending from Ham, you have Cush, uh, which uh, Cush was located uh, south of uh, Egypt, uh, and in ancient times uh, was often called uh, Nubia. Uh, and if you ever see, if you ever see uh, Ethiopia, uh, and, and it's kind of around uh, maybe northern uh, Sudan t today, and maybe a little bit to the, the west, but along the, the coast with the, the Nile south of uh, Egypt. But with uh, today, a lot of times, sometimes you'll see, like in the ESV, they'll have Ethiopia. It's Cush. Uh, it's the same, same word every, every time. I think they're a little inconsistent, uh, and I think unwarrantedly so in, in how, they, how they translate it. But you see this connection with Cush, uh, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, Sabtecha, uh, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Uh, in, Many of these people were spread out uh, to the south uh, and even east across the Red Sea in the western uh, Arabia, along the, along the coast, running all along the, the coast, like uh, Sheba in, in Dedan. And go to Genesis chapter 25. So along the, the eastern coast of uh, semi-northern northern Africa, south of Egypt, and uh, w along western Arabia, from the south to the north. After, uh, after Sarah died, Abraham took another wife, verse 1, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, uh, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak and Shua. So you have Midian or, or Midian there. Uh, the sons of Yokshan, or, or Yokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. Uh, the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Leumim. Uh, the sons of Midian were Epha, Epher, Hanoch, Abida, and Elda. And these were the children of Keturah. And so some of these names, Yokshan doesn't occur, but Sheba and Dedan, and likely what's happening uh, is, and you, you see this elsewhere too, where you have sons, you have nations, you have peoples, and so some who came from Abraham mixed together with these uh, other, other peoples. 
uh, that, uh, that came forth. And you even see that with Ishmael, who married an Egyptian. And Hagar was an Egyptian. And so you, you see this mixing, and you see Midian associated uh, with uh, these, uh, these same, same people along the way. Uh, so these connections with Cush, Cush's descendants, and uh, Midian. But we'll, we'll look at more, and we'll, we'll later see in uh, Habakkuk. In fact, flip there very quickly, just so we can cover this very last point. Habakkuk 3, or Habakkuk. In verse 7, now I'll just read it. I, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So their curtains, their tents of the people, Cushan in Midian. Uh, Midian. Uh, you also see this in, in the Psalms and such, uh, these connections with a place, Cushan, connected very directly with Midian. And so you have this identification uh, that, they're, uh, that they're drawing upon. Uh, and we'll, we'll really see that uh, there may be different reasons. They, they may be trying to critique from the Torah, uh, kind of like the serpent saying, oh, Moses shouldn't, shouldn't have uh, taken, taken this woman who is actually a believer. Or they could also be drawing on even sort of an Israelite prejudice or even an Egyptian prejudice against her, which is really sort of a, a backdoor or gateway for attacking Moses. Uh, th this is just uh, a side issue to attack him, but it's going to draw through into the judgment of Miriam. Uh, and so all of this creation imagery that we're seeing, where they're now coming through the wilderness, you see God's gracious provision along the way, but now their rebellion and judgment comes upon them, and they will not listen uh, to the word of God. They will not listen to God's servant Moses, who's faithful in all his house. Uh, and the author of Hebrews says that, Mo yeah, Moses was faithful uh, in, in all his house as a servant, but Jesus is faithful as a son. Uh, and we'll, we'll be looking at that, not as the servant in the house, but as the very builder of the house. He builds his people. He builds his church by his sacrificial death and detoning work uh, and resurrection, a uh, bearing of uh, their sins uh, and living uh, the righteous life that they couldn't. Uh, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, even believers, died in the wilderness. They couldn't enter into the promised land. Uh, after Joshua, they did not have permanent rest. With David and Solomon, they did not have permanent rest. And so we, we will see uh, this hope of rest that's developing through uh, and that ultimately it culminates in the ultimate servant, uh, the judge of judges, the king of kings, uh, the priest of priests, and the prophet of prophets. Uh, and so I, I think uh, I look forward to, uh, to next week, Lord willing, uh, and we'll be able to dig much more deeply because we've laid some more groundwork uh, for what came before. So let's close in uh, prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, thank you for your servant Moses, but above all, uh, for, for your son, uh, and that we know that we have all uh, rebelled, uh, we have had sinful cravings and desires, uh, we have uh, all like sheep gone astray, uh, each to his own way, uh, away from your word, uh, going astray from the, the, the words of, of your son, uh, your servant par excellence. Uh, but I'm thankful that uh, if we turn from our sin and we confess our sin, uh, that you are faithful and just to uh, forgive us our iniquity, uh, our lawless deeds, uh, and you uh, cleanse us from, from all of our sins by the uh, the death, burial, and resurrection in your Son. And uh, we look forward to uh, his eternal kingdom and uh, your coming kingdom that will bring in uh, everlasting 
uh, your everlasting uh, provision and blessing and peace and rule and rest that will uh, be with, without end and uh, forevermore. And so we thank you for these things and pray that you'd put our, our word, your gospel on our tongues and lips and that our speech would be uh, glorifying to you. And so uh, we give you uh, all the thanks and the praise uh, and the glory and uh, we pray all of these things in the name of uh, your uh, eternal everlasting son. Amen.